Hello, everybody. I understand we have something like 1,400 people all over the world all listening, so don't jostle. There's plenty of room for everybody. Um, I'm going to turn on screen sharing. This is a, an amazing, amazing technology that lets you all see what I see on my screen, except that it doesn't work. Um, you're not going to see the, the menu bar, I believe, and you will not see the bottom of the screen where the dock is, so I'll use charades to tell you what you should be seeing there. So, um, yes, today's talk is about Lion. I have just finished this exhausting, exhausting project of writing uh, Lion, the missing manual. It's 920 pages. Um, it killed my summer. You're welcome. Um, so this is, I don't know if you can see this, this is, uh, this is the book um, in PDF form. It's available as an e-book and as a paper book. Um, and actually, one of the beauties of being a book packager, as I am, meaning that I, I write the book, and on my end, before I turn it into the publisher, I hire editors and designers and layout people. Um, so I, I am complete, in complete control of the book. So this book was actually turned in uh, since, since Steve Jobs passed away. And uh, as you can see, I, I dedicated the book to him. Uh, I think we're entering an uncertain and, um, and very sad era. I don't know who the, the world is going to be imitating now that, that Steve is gone. Anyway, um, the, the overarching design concept behind Lion seems to have been this. Uh, we had a huge hit with our iPad. Let's make the Mac more like the iPad. So over and over again, you'll find these new features and tweaks features that are designed to make the Mac resemble the iPad. So uh, for example, there is uh, a home screen now. If you put four fingers, three fingers and the thumb, on your trackpad, if you have a laptop, uh, and there's ways to do this if you have a magic mouse too. And by the way, two things about all these new touch features. Uh, one is there's two ways to trigger them, one on a laptop, one on a desktop. If you have a laptop, you use the trackpad. If you have a desktop, you use the top surface of the magic mouse. If you have neither of those things, there are keystrokes for some of the features, but in general, you won't be able to use the touch features. And the second major note about all these things is it's a frequent comment, I don't want my Mac to be like an iPad. I like it the old way. Um, and to that I say, fine, you can ignore all of them. All of the new touch features are completely optional. So what I'm going to do is bring up the home screen. I'm going to use four fingers on the trackpad and pinch inward as though I'm bunching up a bunch of cloth. That opens this. Uh, this is the launch, the launch pad. Um, there's a bunch of other ways to open the launch pad. Uh, you can set up a keystroke. The newest Macs actually have a launch pad key on the top row of the keyboard. Um, and you can set up a corner of the screen where you push the mouse just like the screensaver used to work. Still works. Um, as you can see, I have four dots at the bottom. That indicates that I have four pages of this stuff. And I'm using two fingers on the trackpad to swipe to the right to get from one page to the next. Uh, if you have a uh, magic mouse, in general, you uh, take the same number of fingers minus one. So if you have a magic mouse, just use one finger. And the reason for that is that um, the, to, to move, to scroll, to, to point on a trackpad, you use one finger. So you use the mouse. You don't even use one finger. You move the actual mouse. So that's why most of these touch gestures on the magic mouse are trackpad minus one, where you'd use three fingers on the trackpad, you'd use two fingers on the magic mouse, and so on. So these are all my apps. Uh, it's just a quick and easy way to find them and launch them. You can ignore it completely if you want. Um, you can also um, pile them together into, uh, into folders exactly as you can. I don't know why I have two copies of iWeb here, but in the middle of the screen, I'm going to grab one of these things, hold the button down so they all start to wiggle, this should look familiar. They stole this from the iPhone, the iPad, and I can drag one on top of another to create a new, uh, just as I can on the iPad, and I can uh, rename this thing. I can uh, close it by clicking here. And the other interesting thing you can do in, in the launch pad is you can delete programs. Um, that is the ones that you bought from the App Store. Other apps you can't delete. Uh, but any one you see with an X here, 
is an app that I downloaded from the App Store, and I can remove it completely from my Mac with one click on that button. So that's one of the uh, most useful aspects. This thing is going to be more and more like an iPhone. Um, you might notice that whatever your desktop picture is becomes the dimmed out background for the, for the launch pad. So I'm going to change my desktop background to something more uh, alarming. Uh, let's see here. And sometimes the desktop background becomes a little distracting. For example, if I chose this. Um, mm -hmm. So in my launch pad, you'll see that that background is now uh, blurry to help make it easier to see my icons. But there are various variations on this. If you hit Command D, Command is the key next to the spacebar, you cycle through a black and white version, a black and white blurry version, full, sharp, non-blurred color version, and the color version. So that's an undocumented tip that's just designed to help you uh, make things cleaner to see. Now, to open a program, of course, all you do is click it um, on the launch pad. That's the whole point. In fact, let me show you the, the, whole, the whole idea. So here I am on my Mac. I need to open, let's say, uh, iCal. So the whole sequence would look like this. I pinch with four fingers. I find iCal. I click it, and Launchpad goes away, and I'm now in iCal. Um, so you'll soon get used to that, um, that technique. Um, you would be in iCal if the computer had not frozen. Okay. Um, so another big uh, aspect of the Mac that is now much like, um, uh, much like the iPad is full screen mode. Many programs, not all, many programs have this thing in the upper right, the double-headed arrow. And when you click that, the dot goes away, the menu bar goes away, the icons and tool palettes go away, the window expands to fill the entire screen. Um, let's get a, a real web page up here so you can, how about the New York Times? Yes, I've heard of that. All right, do you want to, I'm, this thing keeps bombing out, so I'm going to have to open um, Safari again. Do you want to hand on one of the questions to me that I can answer while we fiddle with this? Sure, let's do it. Dan wants to know, I just upgraded to Lion and I'm frustrated with the Finder window. I really like to see the number of items. Any way to bring that back? Yes, that's a great, a great point. Okay, so are you, seeing, are you seeing the screen sharing now? We can see it now, yes. All right, so uh, anyway, full screen mode is available in many of the Apple programs. In theory, it will soon be coming to the other programs. The cool thing about full screen mode that I can't demo for you because every time I enter it, this broadcasting system crashes. Um, the cool thing is that um, you can then use the three-finger swipe on your, on your trackpad to go from one of these uh, full screen apps to the next. This is all part of another new feature called Mission Control. Um, you swipe three fingers upward to see Mission Control, and what it gets you is the next generation of expose. So over here, I have all my Safari windows. Over here, I have all my preview windows. And up here, I have my various spaces, that is, independent desktops, the left one of which is dashboard. So there are a few things you can do. This is just to find a window in a haystack. The idea is to help you find your way around on your Mac when you've got a million windows open. If you point to an app and press the space bar, you get expose for that document, which is also very helpful in knowing what you're looking at. If you point to one and push uh, two fingers upward, or one finger on the magic mouse, you get a larger view of these things. They spread out and let you see what you're looking at. Um, you can drag individual, individual apps to different desktops, as I'm doing here. I'm taking preview, and I'm putting it on this empty desktop here. I can create another desktop or screen by mousing to the upper right corner, and you see this tab pop out with a plus sign. That's how I can create another desktop. And for all I know, you guys are seeing this all chopped off at the top, so I don't know if you can see it or not. But once you've done that, you can switch from one, one app to another either using keystroke or by using three fingers on your, on your trackpad. Uh, let's 
Um, anyway, so it's a, it's a great way to maximize your screen space um, and to scroll back and forth. By the way, while we're in um, Safari, I should tell you there's another new feature stolen from the iPhone and the iPad. You know how you can du double tap a block of text like this headline, this picture, or this block of text on the touch screen of an iPad? You can do the same thing on the trackpad now. Take two fingers and double tap. Don't double click. Don't actually click the trackpad. Just lightly tap as though you're feeling the trackpad. And that blows up the thing you tap until it exactly fills the screen. It's called smart zoom and nobody talks about it, but it's actually pretty cool. So, um, so in the finder, we were talking about this, this strip at the bottom that before Lion used to tell you the number of items and the no amount of disk space you have free. Um, now you can easily hide or show that by using the, um, the view menu here. That's, that's the, uh, the status bar. So by default, it comes turned off. And while we're here in the finder, I have to tell you some other really weird things that are going on. When you first start up Lion, you will discover that scrolling is backwards. So if I have a, a window like this and I drag downward, I go up, and upward, I go down. It's reversed from what you've used the whole rest of your life. And the reason for that is that Apple has realized that if you want to go to the right, you scroll to the right. If you want to go to the left, you scroll to the left. What sense does it make that when you scroll up, you should move the window down, and scroll down, you move the window up? It doesn't really make sense. So they have changed the paradigm to match the iPad so it's much more direct. If you want to move up in the window, you move up on the trackpad, and so on. So it's really confusing at first. Most people say it takes them a day to get used to it. Um, but the important thing is that you can change that back if you want in system preferences in the trackpad uh, panel. Um, <laughs> under scroll and zoom, it's this first item here, scroll direction, <laughs> natural. Natural means unnatural. So the unnatural uh, scrolling method that Lion does by default can be turned off if you turn off scroll direction natural. Um, some other changes in the finder that are pretty interesting. Um, many people complain about the fact that the sidebar has been rearranged and everything is now the same faded monochrome color. That's, I guess, to make the whole operating system look tidier and newer. There is no way that I know of to bring back the color. Um, another thing is you used to be able to drag things off the, the sidebar just by dragging them with your mouse. Now you can't do that. You have to hold that. So if you try, it'll just snap right back. You have to hold down the command key now. And I'm sure you can imagine why that is. That's because Apple is getting too many calls from beginners who are freaked out that things had disappeared from their sidebar. All oh, my work is gone Where, because they had swiped by accident. So. In fact, you need to hold down the command key there. Um, the, uh, there's some pretty cool things happening in Quick Look. Quick Look is that thing where you, uh, you click a, an icon and hit the space bar to see an instant preview of what's inside it without having to open the actual program. Um, I'm using Quick Look on various things on my desktop here. Um, and first of all, they've expanded the number of, of Quick Look compatible documents. So here's a GarageBand document. Now you can actually see what's in the GarageBand file without even having to open it. Um, and also, this is pretty cool. If you uh, click an icon and hit the space bar, this button at the top right is new. If you click it, or by the way, if you just double click anywhere in the window, that document opens in the, in the program named here. So this is a preview, and now if you want to open the thing, you can just click it. But if you hold the button down here, Nobody realizes this. It's a secret pop-up menu of other programs that could open this file. It's a really handy way to open a program, uh, to open a document in a program that didn't create it. So here's a JPEG file. If I just double-click, it'll open up in preview, but if I hold the button down here, I can open it in Photoshop or any other program that can open JPEG files. Very cool. Another weird change in the finder, you might notice there are no scroll bars anymore. Scroll bar is just gone. And that, again, is to make it look more like an iPad. Um, the scroll bar appears only when you actually start to scroll. So 
I'll wait for them to disappear. When I start to scroll with two fingers on my trackpad or one finger on the magic mouse, the scroll bars reappear only while I'm scrolling. So the advantage here is that, again, you get more screen space available. You don't waste the space to, uh, to your own content by uh, fussing with window glitz. But the downside is that you don't know where you are in the list. I don't know if I'm at the top, at the bottom, if I'm reading a PDF document. I don't know if I have 100 pages to go or two pages to go. So just to let you know, this too can be turned off uh, right in System Preferences. All these things that, um, here, here's scroll bars. Always show them, show them only when scrolling, or scroll them automatically based on the input device. What that means is if you have a mouse, you'll get scroll bars. If you're using the trackpad, you won't because the trackpad is supposed to be more like the iPad. So this, Apple has done a really good job in Lion of changing things but giving you ways to turn them off. So almost all of this stuff can be, can be turned off. There's another really wild new feature in the Finder here. Um, it's a brand new pop-up menu right here that was never here before. It's the Arrange pop-up menu. It's not the same as sorting. Sorting means alphabetical or by date or whatever. Arrange puts things in clumps. So if I view these things by kind, and let's say go to icon view, you can see that all my folders, uh, actually, actually let's go to the, uh, let's go to the, the desktop to do this. Um, so let me arrange by kind and view an icon view. So all my folders on the entire computer are here. All the graphics on the entire computer are in this row. All the PDFs are right here, spreadsheets, so on, documents. And they scroll horizontally with two fingers. So I'm scrolling horizontally with two fingers to see all the folders on my entire computer. And if I don't want to do that, I would rather not have it be a single row, I can click Show All here, and now they scroll vertically as usual. So all my images on the entire computer are here, scroll horizontally. What's really interesting is you can then sort within these groups. So I can still use the sorting controls to sort the things within the groups, which is something we've never been able to do before. Here's something else that's new, all my files. If you click this button, which is in the sidebar, it's a new new view that shows every single file on your computer. So organize by however you've chosen to arrange them by name. This would put them into groups by alphabet, by kind. So here's all the graphics. Uh, then comes all the PDF files and so on. Um, by application, this is wild. You can now see all your files grouped by the application that created them. This is taking a while to compute, but it's, a, it, it's in fact the, um, the default, by the way. When you open a new window, Go Command N. This is the default for the view. You can, of course, change this in Finder Preferences. You can say a new Finder window show, and you can say your home folder or any other folder you like. But the default again. So here's all the files created with Illustrator, and then all the files created with Photoshop, all the files created with GarageBand, and so on. That's pretty cool. Um, here's something new and welcome. You can now resize a window from the edges. First time ever, you can grab any edge of a window to make it a bigger or smaller in that dimension without having to use the lower right corner. You can still use the lower right corner, but you don't have to. That's brand new. Um, another really weird thing is that um, when you open a uh, when you open uh, a document, um, let's see if I can if I have any other. Windows I can use here. All right, well, these are my notes for today. Pretend you don't see it. Um, and then you quit. If I quit Word, you'll notice something weird. When I open Word again, that document will be reopened automatically for me. So what LionBot does by default is it remembers the last documents you had open in each program. So here I'm opening Word again. And without my doing anything, the notes for today's seminar will reappear automatically right there. It's actually really useful because half the time you're working on a document you used to, you were working on before, and this way you don't have to find it and open it. 
And also, it's useful to be reminded of stuff that you, you quit working on right in the middle. That said, you can stop this in any of several ways. If you don't like it reopening the things in System Preferences, once again, you can turn this feature off. It's right there in general. Um, I think it's in general. <laughs> is it not in general? It's in there somewhere. Um, another thing you can do is hold down the Option key as you quit. So if you hold down the Option key, the, the command that usually says quit changes to say quit and close all windows. Now what that means is that the the window will not reopen the next time you open Word. There's even a way, there's even a hack. Oh, a, a third way is to hold down the Shift key as the document is opening. That will also prevent the old windows from reopening. And the last thing is there is a hack that will let you stop that feature in just one program. So you like the feature in Word and Pages, but you don't like it in Keynote, you can make just Keynote stop. That's, um, that's in the book, but you know. Not that I'm here to plug a book or anything. Um, so um, I actually find that feature incredibly useful. There's a related one here. When I shut down, it offers to reopen all the programs and documents that I had open at the time. So I can go ahead and shut down my com computer completely, and when I start it up the next time, everything I had open will return just as I had it. Again, just like the iPad. On the iPad, you don't worry about quitting a program or restarting a program. It's just there. And now the Mac behaves like that, too. Uh, one more thing in the Finder that's really handy. It used to be that if you took a document and dragged it into a folder where there was already a document with the same name, you were offered two choices. Don't move the file here or, re or replace the existing. If I drag this into this folder now, look at this. It tells me that there's already a document there. It offers me the old choice of stop or replace, but there's a third choice, keep both files. That's very handy. Now if I open that file, I'll see that the original is here, and the one I just dragged in here has been added with the name copy. So that's a great way to prevent accidental disaster by dragging over things. Um, oh, actually there is one last thing. Borrowed from Windows, at last it's been decades since the Mac came out, but we have never had a command for cutting and pasting icons. So we've always been able to do this. We've always been able to copy an icon, then move to a different window and paste it. We've always been able to do that. But we've never been able to cut a document from one place and paste it into another. Now we can. So what you do is you copy the icon, like this. Then you go to the new location where you want to paste it. Let's make a let's make a new folder here. And you paste it with the option key down. You will see this changes the paste command into the move item here command. And what that does is it deposits it here and removes it from its original location. So for the first time we have cut and paste, not copy and paste. For icons. Um, a few of the, uh, of the features in Lion are intended for everybody else to adopt later, like software companies. And one of them is, I'm guessing you can't see my doc, is that right at the bottom of the screen? Well, anyway, I know the answer. Have you all left? <laughs> no, <laughs> we're long... still here, David. We can't see the doc, no, but we can certainly see the screen share. Okay. <laughs> For a minute there, I thought I was sitting here talking to myself like an idiot. Um, it turns out that certain programs, mainly Apple programs, TextEdit seems to be the poster child. If you hold your button down on their dock icon, you get this um, this options command. And um, one of the one of the new things in it um, is this show. Uh, sorry, not options. Below options, it says show recent. And without even opening TextEdit. Without even opening the app, if I choose Show Recent, I get this unusual view. It's an icon of all the, uh, the recent documents I've had open in TextEdit, in this program. Um, and if I open one of these, program, open one of these documents with a click, um, I will see if it, in fact, would work. Um, and let's try this again. 
yeah, nothing's working today. I didn't make the right sacrifices to the tech god. But in any case, once you're in TechEdit, um, you can also invoke that show recent command, and you get into um, you get into this view where let's see, uh, you you keep the document that you had online on the screen, um, as well as being able to, to um, as well as seeing where to go. Thank on it. All right. <laughs> anyway, there's some view uh, where you would see the icons down there and the full document open at the same time. While we're in TechEdit, this is a great time to talk about autosave and versions. Now, on the iPad, you don't ever worry about uh, saving a document, right? Everything is saved as you go. And it's the same thing in programs that offer autosave and versions. So um, here is me writing a text edit document. Right now it's untitled. I do have a save command, but that's the last time you're going to see it here. I'm going to save this, call it my life. Now, every time I make a change, let's say I center this, let's say I start typing the actual document, um, and I say, once upon a time I was born, and then I'm going to take a screenshot of a piece of my desktop, and I say, I looked like this. And I'm going to paste that document, uh, that graphic. So I'm making changes, I'm editing away. Notice that if, notice the menu in the upper right here. It used to be that when you had made a change to a document that you hadn't yet saved, the close box right here, the red dot, would develop a black pinpoint in the middle. That was your indication that this document had not been saved. These documents save continuously. So that dot won't appear, but what it will do is show me in light writing right here that this document is edited. So I have edited it since the last version. Well, what's a version? It's like Time Machine. Check this out. If I click in the title bar, I click this little triangle right here, I can use this command called Browse All Versions. This is crazy. Hold on to your hat. I'm going to go into this Time Machine land, and I hope it doesn't break my screen sharing. And in Time Machine land, I will see the icons for uh, see the documents for all the versions of this, every change I've made. Okay, you guys still with us? With us? Are you still seeing this? Yep, we can still see it. Okay, so on the left is the document in its current position. On the right are the previous versions. So it started out like this, left justified, um, no text, no graphic. And then on the right-hand side, I have this time ruler here, just like in Time Machine. I say, okay, well, here's where I added some text. Here's where I pasted that graphic. So the idea here is that you can, if you went wrong in your editing, you took it in a wrong direction, you can scroll back in time, even if it was weeks or months ago, and recover an earlier version. You have two options. You can say, I liked it better this way, restore it. Click this Restore button at the bottom of the screen. Or you can actually copy and paste. So if most of it was, was good, but you had one paragraph you really liked that's been deleted in the meantime, like let's say I love this graphic or this, this sentence. This is a masterful sentence. So I can say copy that, Command C, or I can just drag it into the current version, and I've recovered this text from the old version without disturbing the new version. And then I say done. I come back to my real world, and I've just recovered something from time gone by or restored the, the entire document. Unfortunately, this works in very few programs so far. It's text edit and I think pages and maybe one or two others. Um, but it's autosave is great and versions is great. Um, there's also this notion that I frankly don't understand of locking a document. If you lock a document, uh, it can't be changed anymore. If you try to change, make changes, it, it says, hey, this is locked. Do you want to unlock it, thus defeating the whole purpose of the exercise, or do you want to duplicate it and make an unlocked version and keep your locked copy? I asked Apple, when would you use this? Like, what's it actually for? And they basically said, it's if you want to lock it. <laughs> so, yeah, I get that, but ah, never mind. Um, 
So some people have noted that there is um, there is now a, uh, a spelling checker that works like the iPad. Um, if you turn on this feature called uh, uh, correct spelling automatically, then as let me make this bigger so you can see it. Um, then as you type, did you see that? It corrects. Well, it didn't correct that one. The typos, it drives. Okay, here's another example. Sometimes it will show you the underline, just like on the iPad, that says, hey, I have a, a suggestion for you. Um, and sometimes it, well, okay, well, that was a bad example. But often it will pop up a bubble above, let's say, government. So that one it corrected automatically, and it puts this color underline. Um, so I can actually um, control click that and have it change its correction back again. So if you turn on that feature, uh, it will correct spelling as you go in real time, just like the iPhone does. Uh, people are complaining about this. It's like, I don't want it correcting me. Well, then fine, turn it off. Um, one of my favorite features has always been um, data detectors. And data detectors are um, uh, ways in, in mail, especially, and in other basic tech programs, where you can point to information and it will recognize that, for example, as an address. I'm just pointing to this in an email. If I click the little pop-up menu, it actually offers to add that to my address book um, or add to an existing address without my having to copy, paste, fill in the fields, and so on. It's really handy. This one is amazing. Look at, we're thinking of setting up a basic training session for November 12th at 1.30. It's smart enough to know that that's a time and a date. If I click the pop-up menu here, it actually shows me my calendar for that day and lets me know in dotted lines where it would be if I added that to my calendar. So right from the email, without copying and pasting or anything, I can add this meeting to my calendar just by clicking Add to iCal up at the top here. Or I can edit it first and change the name of it. They're fantastic. And by the way, if you see a web address in here, this is really amazing. I don't know if you can see this. Uh, this web address uh, at the bottom here, I'll move it up. If I point to this, the pop-up menu actually lets me see the web page without my having to open Safari. I can x-ray vision into that web address right in my email. I mean, that is just wicked cool. That is fantastically cool. Um, so. One really interesting thing about Lion is that it is not sold on a DVD. You can buy it only um, as a download from the App Store. So let's see, let's see if I can show you that. Um, and this is really, really good for a lot of reasons. First of all, if you ever need to install Mac OS X on another Mac, you don't have to download it. Uh, you don't have to run around finding the disk. You can just download it again. What you do is you go to the Purchase tab of the App Store, and here is everything that you've ever bought, and you can just download it again. Um, if you were on a different Mac, this would not say installed, it would say install. Uh, although there is a trick, by the way, if you want to install it again, hold down the option key as you click the purchase button, and then the installed button changes to install, and you have the opportunity to install Lion again on the same machine if you need to do that. So another great advantage of this is that as Apple comes up with the little updates, you know, Lion 10.7.1, 10.7.2, when you reinstall Lion or install it on another Mac, you will always be downloading the latest version from the App Store. That's not how it was in the DVD days when you'd have to find the DVD and then you'd have to install all the updates and it was a pain. So it's neat, it's tidy, it's up to date, it's easy and you're allowed to install Lion on as many Macs as you have for the same 30 bucks. So that's very handy. What's not so handy is, what are you supposed to do if your hard drive gets damaged? You no longer have a DVD you can start up from. So therefore, uh, it's very important to make yourself, um, well, well, there's two things you can do. One thing you can do is, um, let's see, I might be able to find, um, a picture of this thing. 
uh, startup manager. Um, there's a if you hold down the uh, option key as the computer is starting up, or you, or you can press uh, Command R. Um, let's do it this way. Um, let's search for startup manager. You get the familiar view of your disks. Here we go. This is what it looks like. Uh, if you, hold, if you hold down the option key during startup or hold down the command R, you find a view like this where you see your hard drive and then you see a new hard drive you didn't know you had called the recovery hard drive, recovery HD. When you install Lion, it subdivides your hard drive, it partitions your hard drive and creates a very small secret partition, a piece of the hard drive that you can start up from separately. All you do is you click this. And then you will boot into uh, especially emergency manager. Um, let's see if I can show you a picture of that. Um, yes, it looks like this. So you 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 um, you hit you hold the option key and then click recovery HD or press command R as the computer is starting up and you get this. You get an emergency screen that lets you reinstall Mac OS 10, run Disk Utility to repair whatever is wrong with the hard drive or restore the computer from your latest time machine backup. So that's how Apple gets around not having an actual disk when something goes wrong. However, um, there is something even cooler if you have a MacBook Air or a Mac Mini, one of the new Mac Minis, or any Mac that was released since Mac OS X Lion came out. What they give you there is, if you can believe it, you can reboot your dead computer from the Internet. So the problem with this technique I'm showing you now is that it works only if your secret partition is still working. But what if the whole hard drive is munched? What if the thing is completely destroyed? Well, you won't be able to do that. So if you have one of the newer Macs, you can then boot up over the Internet, if you can believe it. Yes, Safari and your Wi-Fi connections still work even without a hard drive, even when the computer is completely dead. However, I still recommend that you create an emergency flash drive. You can build a, um, your own flash drive. Um, uh, this, is, this is, yeah, Lion Internet Recovery. Um, you can build a physical recovery disk, either a disk that contains the Lion installer on it, and that will let you reinstall Lion from flash drive. You need an 8 gig flash drive for that. Or you can create a flash drive that contains only those emergency recovery utilities even a two gigabyte flash drive will work for that. Um, and the book gives you step-by-step -step instructions, and you, or you can find them online um, for building those two flash drives. But it's, I, I think it's really important to do that so you have a physical reinstallation method. So just a few other quick things that I dearly love. Here's one of the most successful features in all of Lion. It's always been a pain transferring files from one Mac to another over, an, over a, uh, a network because you have to set up an account you need a name, you need a password for each person. No longer, my friends, all you do is click all my files, and what you will see is your icon, your Mac icon, sooner or later, hello, and then you will see icons of, oh, sorry, I clicked the wrong button, sorry, AirDrop. I haven't had a lot of sleep if you hadn't gotten that impression already. So AirDrop shows you your Mac as the center of your universe. And around this icon, you will see the other icon of Max running Lion. Uh, let's see a, a better picture of this. Uh, yeah. Um, hey, you know what's cool about Safari, by the way? In your results here, you can drag one of your results right out of the menu. Look at this. I can drag a result right onto the desktop. That's pretty cool. Um, anyway, now where'd it go? <laughs> here we go. So this is what it would look like. Um, you would see the icons of other people with the lion near you. Now what's really cool is behind the scenes it's creating a private Wi-Fi ad hoc network. You do not have to be on the internet. You do not have to be on a network. This is automatic and behind the scenes and independent of the Wi-Fi network you're on. So what you do is you can drag an icon from your finder onto the icon of any other person nearby. The only rules are they need Lion also, and they need the airdrop window open.
just like you do. You both have to have your airdrop windows open. You drag it onto that icon. It asks you to confirm. The other person confirms, the recipient, and then you see this cool circular progress bar wrapping around that icon, and you have just transferred a file without any permissions, names, account information, or anything. It's, it's fantastic. It shows up in the other person's downloads folder, which makes a lot of sense, actually. So that's one of the absolute best features ever. Um, there's some great features now in, um, uh, in the new apps. So I'll just show them to you really quickly. Um, iCal has been redesigned. The day view is sort of more, more like the iPad. It's an agenda view where you see, um, you see your upcoming schedule and tomorrow's schedule and so on. Um, there's now a year view. What's cool about the year view is it has what they call a heat map. It shows you by the intensity of color how busy you are during each day. So if someone says, hey, we should make that trip to the Adirondacks. How about the week of November 7th? You can say, uh, not good for me. Um, one change that's not so good is there used to be a list of calendars down the left side, that is appointments, um, I'm sorry, not appointments, uh, categories of appointments like home, work, kids. Now that has been confined to a pop-up menu. Uh, you have to click it here, otherwise it works the same. Uh, that's a little annoying. Um, another big change is um, in photo booth. <laughs> Somebody has been working overtime at Apple. Check this out. Photo booth has always been this cool um, way to take weird distorted pictures of yourself. But they have these new um, new effects now. Oh, hello there. I don't know if this is going to work. But so you click effects. And this thing, look at the one on the middle right. It actually puts birds around my head. It is tracking my head. It, the birds actually follow my head around. And over on the left here, this love truck. I need to know. So uh, very clever. And um, all these also, these are a little odd, but they do follow you around. And you can have actual multi multiple people in the same picture. So they've done some stuff. This is also a full screen app, one of those full screen apps that, that uh, fills your screen. Um, very handsomely done. QuickTime Player has been upgraded in some neat ways. Uh, oops. That's the wrong version. I keep the old version around because it used to be better at editing. So in QuickTime Player, you can, for the first time, record, um, see how it opened up the previous version? That's that previous, previous document thing. You can record the screen as you always could before, which is great for training and showing things, how things work. But now it actually asks you what part of the screen you want to record. So before it could only record the full screen, now you can say, I just want to record this much. Start recording. So now I'm making a quick time recording of my screen activity. And when it's all done, I have myself a quick time recording of my screen activity. Oh, see how it's highlighting the mouse? That's, that's an option. When you do a screen recording, uh, a new option in this pop-up menu here, show mouse clicks in the recording. You can also record yourself, um, say, new movie recording, and then it will use your, your built-in camera to film yourself. So if I want to send a video message to somebody, I could just do it this way. Um, but most interesting of all, if you can believe it, QuickTime Player can now edit, just like it could before they messed it up in Snow Leopard. So let me open up um, a, um, a movie here. So this is one of my recent CNBC movies. Oh, sorry, that's, that's opening up in the wrong version of QuickTime again. Uh, should open any moment now. All right, we'll, we'll use my screen recording this time. So you can now drag this bar along, and for the first time, you can split the clip. So I'm going to hit Command-Y, and look what's happened. I've split my movie into two pieces, and then I can play this piece, and I can split the clip again. Uh, let's uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, let's cancel the trimming. There, I put the cursor there. I hit Command Y, so I can chop my movie into these different clips, and then I can rearrange them. I can actually drag them around. I can trim them individually using the old trim command. Double click, move the end inwards, and hit trim. And in this way, you can edit your videos that you captured in all the usual ways. You can 
trim, rearrange, shorten in, frankly, what's one of the most easy to use, simple um, interfaces that I've ever seen. Um, I guess the last thing I want to cover and then we'll take some questions. Um, as you may realize, uh, Lion does not have Rosetta anymore. Rosetta was the, um, the technology that let really old programs, uh, Intel, uh, PowerPC programs, run on Intel chips. And Apple says, look, it's been five years. I think it's time to move on from those PowerPC programs. Rosetta programs do not run anymore. The only three programs that anyone really cares about are Microsoft Office, really old versions like 2004, and AppleWorks, and Quicken. So AppleWorks, the problem is pretty simple, easily solved. Uh, pages and numbers will open up your AppleWorks documents and convert them. Um, Microsoft Office, just get a newer version. But Quicken is a real problem because there's no real equivalent. There's iBank, some people are liking, and Mint can perform some of the functions, but Quicken 2007 does not run in Lion. Um, the good news is there are rumors that they are about to have a fix for this, so uh, don't, don't panic yet, but if you need it, uh, if you need Quicken right now, don't upgrade the Lion. Um, and let's see, I think, yeah, that's, that's it for the, for the crash course. Um, let's see if I can go back to the, uh, the login thing and see what your questions are. Um, let's see, Alan says, I, boot, I dual boot Snow Leopard and Lion on the same computer. I can't install App Store apps on Lion because the App Store says they've already been installed. How do, install, how do I install these apps on the external drive? Well, now, Alan, you know the answer to that. You hold down the option key as you click the purchase uh, button. Uh, what does David define as newer Macs, Captain wants to know? Well, there's two categories. Um, Lion runs on most Macs since about 2006, I think. It does require Snow Leopard, though. You have to start with Snow Leopard. So I said it's $30. Uh, maybe it's $60 if you need to buy Snow Leopard first. And the reason you need Snow Leopard is because you can only get, um, you can only get Lion um, through the App Store, and you need Snow Leopard to get the App Store. Um, then I also mentioned newer Macs as having um, things like internet recovery and the painted on launch pad keys on the top row. And those are any Macs released since Lion. That is the latest MacBook Airs, MacBook Pros, and um, Mac Mini. Um, Ricardo says, if I buy a new MacBook Pro, what happens with my previous Lion purchase? purchase? Well, now you know the answer to that, too. Um, you can reinstall it from the App Store using the technique I just showed you. Uh, Anna wants to know, I have not yet installed Office on my new Lion laptop. Can I download it or do I need to buy a, a CD? Is it available through the App Store? No, not yet. Microsoft has not put Office on the App Store, so you still have to buy that one on a DVD. Uh, Daniel wants to know, what happens if I want to buy a new hard drive and I actually bought and installed Lion on the old one? Well, that's the same question again. Go to the App Store and go to your Purchase tab. Oh, please cover Duplicate versus the previous Save As version. Okay, John, that's a really good question. This is an app that work with autosave and versions. Um, there is no save as the command anymore. That's a really good point. If we were in TextEdit, we saw that there was a save command, but no save as, because Apple says, why do you need a save as? We're creating new versions for you all the time. However, there is a new version of, a new equivalent of save as, and that is export. So any autosave program has an export command that lets you spin off the current version of your document as a standalone, and that is the equivalent of the um, uh, that is the equivalent of the save as command. Um, Eileen wants to know: Wait, did that copy and paste in the icon move the document too? Yes, exactly. That's the point. The new copy and move feature lets you move an icon from one place to another. Um, let's see. A lot of people asking how to install Lion again. I think we've, we've covered that. Richard wants to know, they took away the arrows at the ends of the scroll bars. Have you heard if they will be coming back or at least an option to turn them back on? You know, there is, a, there is an app out there. I'm trying to remember the name of it. It might be called Lion Tweaks um, that lets you turn off all of these little, uh, all of these little features. 
Um, let me see, I'm just opening a document to tell you for sure. Um, oh, here's another thing. Here's some of the other things that have changed. If you hold down a letter key, it no longer repeats. If you hold down the E, it doesn't go E, 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 E anymore. Instead, it brings up the palette of accents, just like the iPhone and iPad do, like, you know, accent grave, accent aigu, um, which is, you know, it's neat, but some people like to say, yay, Y, A, 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 Y, Y, or boo, B, O, 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 and you can't do that anymore by holding down the key. So that is something that you can turn off as well. Um, if you if you download this um, this little app, I'll try to remember. If, if it's not Lion, oh yeah, it is. It's called Lion Tweaks. Lion Tweaks. It's freeware, and it lets you turn off all of these features um, independently if you if you're not enjoying them. Um, let's see. Karen wants to know in the address book are the contact data entry fields now uniform between the phone, iPhone and the Mac? Yes, I believe they are. And we also haven't talked about iCloud. Um, it's, uh, it's the successor to MobileMe, and in my experience, it works beautifully. I am in, in heaven that when I make a change to my calendar or my address book, when I'm out and around with my phone, it's automatically made everywhere else, on my iPad and on my Mac. So in my family, uh, we all share, you know, uh, we all share calendars so we can see what each other is doing. And it's so great that we don't have to sync anything or update anything. It's all happen, happening automatically, and it's for free. Um, David wants to know, is it true that Lion will not boot into a boot camp partition on a second internal drive unless it is the first partition on that drive? Yes, that's true. Um, it has to be installed on the first drive. Uh, Jakobus wants to know, is there a way to get iCal to permanently show the list of calendars? as it did in Tiger and Leopard. No, it can't. Um, however, I cannot recommend highly enough BusyCal. BusyCal is um, uh, it's, it's an amazing uh, app. It's inexpensive. It relies on the same um, database as iCal. So any changes you make to, um, I'm going to open it for you here, any changes you make to um, iCloud or your Google Calendar or iCal itself um, shows up here. So if this company ever goes out of business, all your, appointment, all your um, uh, appointments will still be there. You can always go back to iCal. But it's so cool. This is my trip at Calendar. Um, I can turn on and off calendars um, with, a, with a click. It's really a fantastic, fantastic calendar program. Um, and here you can see that your your calendars are always here. You can hide them, you can shorten them, but they're always there. So I find this far superior to iCal, but it uses the same database of appointments. So I think that's a, a really great uh, solution for that problem. Um, Richard wants to know, how many things broke when upgrading? I can't live without my calendar, OmniFocus, and Apple Mail. Oh my gosh, I haven't talked about Mail. Oh, it is so awesome. Mail is so great. Um, first of all, I love this three-pane view. Uh, you can go back to the old view if you want. Um, it's just filled with fantastic features. Um, one of the ones that I love is you can hide the mailboxes pane entirely and have the whole screen for doing mail, and then you put the most important folders up here. You can drag these around, you can drag new things up here, um, and have instant access to those things without needing your mailboxes there. It's just absolutely, I switched from the Microsoft Entourage or Outlook, and I've never been happier. This, this mail program is spectacular. Um, so Richard, the answer to your question is not very much breaks at all. Um, Quicken and Apple Work seem to be the big two. To my knowledge, there aren't any other problems with apps, but you can always look online, do a, do a quick search. Um, Ricardo wants to know, how is the function of time capsule online? Time capsule is basically the same as it always was, but better, with one really cool change. Are you guys seeing my screen? Oh, it looks like the screen share just turned off, David. Oh, all right. Tell me if you can see it in one second. Yep, it's loading right now. Okay. So what they've added is a local time machine. I don't know if you realize this, but 75% of all Macs sold are laptops, 75%. So now in time machine, 
you can do this amazing thing. You can enter Time Machine even though you haven't been at home. So what I'm saying is I can go into Time Machine on my laptop even though I'm far from home, far from my backups, because it makes a local backup as I work. So I can actually go back in time on my own laptop's hard drive. I can recover files. I can recover files that I change in ways that I want to change my mind about, even though I've never been connected to the external backup disk. It's making local backups on my desktop. So Time Machine now works locally, which is really fantastic. Um, I hope that's clear to you guys. But it's the first time I tried that, I was just, you're kidding me, that really works. Um, Ken says, why can't you save a document in preview? It seems you have to duplicate it first and then save. Well, that's auto-save at work, Ken. And the answer to that is you still can save a document or save as, I think you're really asking, by using the export command. Uh, John says, David, is there one section of the book that has tips or keystroke surprises? <laughs> what are you, a plant? Uh, yes, indeed. There is an entire appendix called the Master Lion Keystroke List that has every single one of these keystrokes Tidally listed. Um, question, what was the command key that changed the desktop and launch pad? Command B for background. So that was, uh, William had the same question. So, okay, I guess that is uh, the end of our time. There's a quick taste of what's new in Lion. Uh, feel free to email me anything else you come up with at pogue at nytimes.com. Let me uh, give you that in typewritten form here. pogue at nytimes.com. And I'll be happy to answer any questions for you. Um, so the book is Mac OS X Lion, the missing manual. And uh, the iPhone book uh, is coming out in a couple of weeks, too, for the new iPhone. Thank you all.